when Salome opened at the mat two, I think it did one or two performances, and one of the wealthy uh, supporters of the Met's daughter thought it was a shame it was taken out of the repertoire, gone. Right. And this would be 1890? No, 19, early 1900s. It's not that long ago. And she thought if you're taking out of the repertoire because it was too sensual or too... Yeah, exactly. That's not what opera's about. Opera's about heroics. You know. And opera was, European opera was about heroics and the gods and the princes because it was a f art form done for the princes, the royalties, the dukes, and the barons? It wasn't a well, common person. No, I think you have to go back. I think you have to go back to Monteverdi, late um, 1500s. The first opera was, was Orfeo, uh, uh, which he wrote, and then he wrote two others, um, uh, The Return of Ulysses and uh, The Coronation of Popea. And those operas are uh, through composed with with uh, recitative and once in a while a little aria breaks out and it's recitative but it's closer because they were looking for what the music was like in the Greek plays that's what they were looking for they were trying to figure out what that was about so you got a, you don't get the aria and the recit as, as we know it in the late 19th century so you have that kind of line. I mean, they're great. So the recitative in the Monteverdi's is reimagining a Greek chorus singing? As they were thinking about it, yeah. Therefore, the themes were Orfeo, Popea. They were all uh, great classical themes. And then it gave way, uh, and, then, and then just jumping, with a, you went to Handel. And Handel was very specific kind of Baroque formal, right? Then it went to Gluck, and it became a little, he was trying to go back to what Monteverdi was doing, getting out of the formality, and then you come to Mozart. And Mozart is, for me, the great opera composer. But those early operas are about gods and goddesses and kings and queens. That's correct. And yes, there's a servant. All right, and now. yes, there's a small part over there, a common person. Mm -hmm. But they're the stories yeah. of the power structure at the time, and then only later did the servants what get followed, bigger roles. But what suddenly, followed the Baroque was the Enlightenment, and Mozart and the Enlightenment. Right. And the Enlightenment was talking about the people. So you get Cosi, which is not about the gods, Figaro, which is about a servant, Don Giovanni, which is, a, 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 which is about a nobleman gone to rat shit, gone to seed. <laughs> this is democratic rights pushing up that's, politically. That's right. We have kings, we have princes, we yeah. have monarchs, we have duchies, yeah. but the democratic push is coming up, and the writers of the operas are starting to reflect right. that. Well, that they're reflecting Beaumarchais and, 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 uh, Don Gio and um, Marriage of Figaro and the Barber of Seville. I mean, so they're taking the Beaumarchais plays, right? right and turning them into to operas, and because of the genius of Mozart, they worked. I mean, and 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 De Pont, De Ponte, who who is a great librettist, um, and a Rabelaisian figure in his own right. So, and then you know it moves from there into the early nineteenth-century bel canto opera, in which the voice became the dictating, the dicta dictated the opera. And then you get into the romantic with Verdi and Wagner and Puccini. But it still was an art form for, I don't want to say royalty class, upper class and upper middle class. Not in Italy. Not in, in Italy. Italy it would Italy, be for it was, everyone. Yeah, in Italy it was for but all. in Germany and France. Germany in too. Germany too. Oh, okay. but Germany too. Oh, yeah. So then when opera becomes an elite form in the 20th century, you know, I dress up. I go to the opera, I don't, it then opens up and then we get musical theater as a kind of every man's person opera. So we have elite musical narrative and yeah. musical theater again. I think what's happening now is there's a desperate push on the part of opera companies to take it back to being part of the daily life, not the, the big put your tuxedo on. Unfortunately, you st 
works. There are companies that still have tuxedos on their opening night. That's, I'm not going to pass judgment because there is something wonderful about dressing up to go to the theater. But there's also something wonderful about being wearing jeans and a t-shirt and going to the theater. So they both have their values. Uh, is one better than the other? I have no idea. But again, it's what power structure that art is serving. Yeah. Is it stroking the powerful? Is it speaking to the middle well, class and all I don't, classes? I don't know whether you can put it that way. I think it's who's paying for it. <laughs> you know? But in our world, who's paying for it? Is that another way to say, to which power source am I playing? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And when an opera is staged at the Met, it has a budget of what? Oh, million. Between three to oh. ten million dollars. Well, it cost them fifteen million to reinforce the stage for the production of Lepage's uh, ring cycle. That's to reinforce the stage, not for the set. Fifteen million. Yeah. So this money is not coming from Joe's Diner and you know the kids not, who are working at. It's not coming from you and I. Starbucks <laughs> no, us. no. This so is again, coming from big, big. Big it's donors, big money. And, and you know, one you have to ask the question: Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, if you don't have the donors, you don't have the Met, and I think the Met is a, is a opera house that's needed. I I don't agree with how they do things, but I don't think that means that you should take it away. I mean, the Met the Met ha introduces fabulous singers and some wonderful productions, and and it's got probably the best orchestra in the in North America, the Met Orchestra. So, I mean, it has its value and a place, and it's an important place. But that doesn't mean it's the only place. So where are the counterpoints to the Met in, in the... Well, I, I tell you, there's about five companies in New York that are small companies doing interesting new plays in odd, in odd and different venues. I mean, operas slowly, slowly inching along to realizing you don't need an opera house to do an opera. You can do it in a black box. You can do it in a living room. You can do it in a warehouse. You can do it anywhere. Uh, I mean, we did a, a, car, a Carmen and Boston Commons, and we had a trailer which was put down as the stage. And there were 130,000 people over two nights came to see that Carmen. It was the most extraordinary event uh, in, in, in Boston. And it was really exciting because people would come at 4 o'clock and put their blankets down. And that wasn't a big, lavish production, believe me. But it worked. And you don't need opera houses, as you don't need theaters to do plays. Let me get this straight. <laughs> you put yourself through bookkeeping school <laughs> by being a professional actor. I said, yeah, you could say that.